crime, sports, and entertainment. A recent report from the Opportunity Agenda showed that those are the three areas where media focuses coverage on black men. Many people feel across this country that men are more often than not shown in an unflattering light. And if they aren't sports stars or rappers, then they must be what? A criminal. Well, tonight we're going to talk to a group of men in the media field who are going to share their thoughts and experiences as we explore the evolving climate when it comes to the perception that many people across America, including the black community, have of black males in the media. Welcome to our 25th anniversary industry conversation. The changing coverage of black men in America. DCTV proudly presents its speaker series. This dynamic series of panel discussions will engage dialogue that explores television and media industry with the nation's leading experts. These interactive forums were created to facilitate conversations which are important to you. So join us for a unique insider's perspective, and it all starts right now. Welcome members and viewers. I'm Armstrong Williams, your moderator for the night's live town hall meeting. We're coming to you live as we celebrate DCTV's 25th year of service to our community. Tonight, we're hosting our third industry conversation about the change in coverage of black men in the United States. Now, you can find out more about our upcoming speaker series and other 25th anniversary activities by visiting dctv.org. And don't forget to share your thoughts about this topic on Twitter at hashtag industry convo. And later in the show, we'll be taking questions from our live studio audience as well as our social media desk. Tonight, we're joined by a very distinguished panel, and we welcome them. Jamal, welcome to uh, our town hall meeting. We're glad to have you join us. Good to be here. Thank you. Yes. Jenks Martin, welcome to the panel. Always. And last but not least, Mr. DJ himself, 93.9 personality, Easy Street. Welcome to the, to the conversation. Thank you. Um, you're also, it's interesting, a co-founder in Circle Friends. You're a mentor in the, uh, in the inner city of, of America. You know, what can you tell us? You know, you, we have this conversation. We have it often. And we've ha heard the stories. What is it that you have been able to glean from your mentorship that these young men so desperately need and what they're really crying out for that we're missing? Love. Love. And um, it's really sad that when you go out to the schools, you talk to the young people, you look in their eyes, you can see that, you know, the, the missing pieces of their lives. A lot of times, it's a lack of a father. And we know that in the African-American family, the father not being there, we have a lot of young brothers that are growing up without the dad role. They don't know uh, the basics about how, you, how do I tie a tie? You know, um, who's going to teach me how to shave? You know, how should I wear my pants? How should I uh, talk to my mom? You know, how should I act in relationships? And we're seeing that play out in negative ways because of the lack of the father. But that's only one of the issues I see. Well, so, Jenks, are, are we insinuating here that the breakdown of the family and single motherhood is having a huge impact on the plight of black men in America? I think we need to be guarded and careful in using that language of, of single motherhood because as there are challenges, social challenges that Easy kind of elaborates on, there's some other areas where young black people are accelerating, you know, beyond belief to, to where the generation before them really looks like Forrest Gump compared to what they're doing right now. So I, I'm guarded and I'm cautious about that. So and to, to go to the question you asked uh, Easy, I think that, that what we need most to interject in the young people is a validation, uh, acknowledgement, acceptance, and approval of who they are in their identity and in their own individual accomplishment now because I think we, we've dropped the ball. I'll, I'll say this in closing. I really don't believe that there is a black youth problem in America. There's a black adult problem mm -hmm. in America mm -hmm. that we have not done our job for these young people to give them what, you know, what they should have to have a more positive outcome. Mm -hmm. so, so, Jamal, uh, I mean, you're on television, you're on CNN, you're on MSNBC, you work for the Clinton White House, you've coordinated some extraordinary visits for this, his administration around the world, graduated from Harvard. Obviously, you have been able 
from perception to realize the American dream. Is it unfair to say, as we say sometimes, because you were able to make it and the panelists were able to make it, there's no excuse for no one not to be able to achieve what you've done, given your circumstances and your background? You know, <clears throat> I did all those wonderful things, but I also grew up in Detroit in the 1980s during the crack epidemic. Uh, I had a single, some single mother family for a while, then I was in a single father family for a while until I lived with my dad and I started high school. And we saw everything. We saw friends killed, shot, we saw drugs, we saw, you know, there's alcohol abuse, there was all sorts of stuff going on in the neighborhood, relatives, the whole thing. Um, the difference, I think, we talk about fatherhood, having my dad there was an incredibly important part of my life. Uh, and being able to really smack me upside the head, snatch me out of school when I was, when I was screwing up, um, all those things are important. But we can't take the economy out of this question. You know, so I grew up, again, in a place like Detroit. So in the 1970s, you had 700,000 plus jobs General Motors had in the state of Michigan alone in the 1970s. Today, General Motors employs about 34,000 people in the state of Michigan. What happened to the other 700,000 people who used to work in those auto factories? You know what happened to them? They're out in the streets. And so we've got to figure out what are we going to do about employment in our communities so that black men are earning enough money, that they stay in their families, they raise their kids, they do all the things that we expect husbands, fathers, uh, and members of the community to do. So easy, the, the, and, and that's a very good point about employment, but some would say, the critics would say, they don't have the employable skills. It goes back to what I just said earlier. There are so many different issues. It's not just one thing. It's not just the fathers. It's just not just the economy. There are so many different pieces of the puzzle that are not, that are not in place that cause the problem that we, have, that we have today. So I don't think we can just isolate it on one little thing, but I think we need to do work in each of these areas to be able to bring up the perception and make it better for us as a people. Well, you know, James, you have interest in body language and that. I see you squinching. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just, you just, you know, you know, what is frustrating you, just tell us. It's, it's how we frame this. I'm, I'm getting ready to have like almost a visceral response to even how we're framing the identity of black men. So we start off with the, press, the preface that they're inadequate, that they're, they're shortcomings, that there's a crisis, that there's a problem with them, and that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy or this stereotypical mold that they fall into. When, okay, so you asked the question, you know, uh, employment and economy. So in my mind, what just went on, well, well black men make more money than, than black women and Hispanic men and Hispanic women. Black and almost, men do? Black men. Tell us that story. That's uh, an interesting story, right, audience? Uh, well, tell <laughs> us more. <laughs> no, no, tell no, us more. No, black men's... The median income for black men is on par, almost at, at the same, as white women who stay at home, but there's some other things going on. So when I, when I start hearing the negative of it, my, I want to be the counterbalance to this conversation, that, you know, if we constantly drive towards what's wrong with the brothers, where are they coming up short, what, what can we do to help them out, then we, we're opening up this chasm of, of ineptitude for their identity. I want, I want to stick with this. I, I want to come at you guys. Mm -hmm. I want to be fair here. So why don't you tell us, because okay. I know you've done movies on this, right. you've focused on this topic. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell us what's the real perception of the achievement that we don't talk about, the stats, the back it up, of how black men are progressing in America? And, and, with, with me, I don't like baby boomers, even though I'm one. I can't stand them. They get on my nerves. <laughs> baby boomers are just this, this, this anomaly in black history. So education-wise, entrepreneurial-wise, corporate penetration-wise, even um, as they, they start to expand in these other areas of, of, of uh, achievement, but like right now, in his story, black men are graduating from high school at the highest rate ever in the history of this country, period. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the study just came out yesterday from American Enterprise Institute that a black father in the household increases your potential to graduate from college. The, 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 these things, so we can't just... And, and uh, again, to uplift my sisters, I, I say, you know, there might be an upside to having father absence in certain situations mm -hmm. because women have a hyper emphasis on education, which is translated into graduation rates, college matriculation rates, um, uh, college enrollment rates. It's gone just quadrupled since, you know, the 70s. So these things that uh, this group of individuals are doing is the counterbalance to what the media is constantly telling us that they're not, that they're criminals, that they're thugs, that they're inadequate, that they need uh, affirmative action, that they need to uh, uh, uplift and elevate it because they start off from a place of inadequacy, which I viscerally and wholly reject. M black men are just as capable and competent as anybody else out there, and I refuse to accept that, that we need to start from a preface that they are less than. I can't do it. Not easy. 
you can't give us any more sound bites. Well, you <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. I, I'm sorry, but well, well, I'm passionate well, about gotta, that. I see your okay. bottle. So give us I some, am, give us some know, meat. I, I am, I am a fan of this man's work. Okay. He had a documentary called like Hoodwinked, right. and this his work changed my life because, wow. yes, it did. And I know I never said that to you. Wow. Yes, yes, because he's a numbers guy, and a lot of times numbers don't lie. And mm -hmm. so he went into uh, the Department of Education mm -hmm. and found the numbers that actually proved that there are more African-American students in college than, in er than, than that are in jail. Right. Because the media will pump out a story and say, hey, the brothers are in jail at an alarming mm -hmm. rate, X, Y, Z. Yep. But this guy goes and finds the numbers right. to refute that and prove that, hey, no, that, that's not the truth. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I give him tall respect, and he's so, absolutely so right. So this is where we must go with this. I don't know how much time we have Sorry, before the break, know. but I'm being enlightened. <laughs> so, I mean, so look. Is there a conspiracy in the media not to tell the truth? Wow. Is there? Wow. Can we get to that part? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good part. How much time right? we got? Yeah, we're <laughs> we ready for that one. <laughs> so, uh, no, seriously. Because what we came here tonight to discuss within the first few minutes has just been tossed out and said, wait a minute. That's not who we are. So why would the media, well, well let me get Jamal in here. Okay, why? All this focus on black men being in such an endanger, in danger, not being educated, being in prison, victims, uh, uh, they perpetrate crime. Why all this and not the stories that we're hearing? So I don't buy into conspiracies. Okay. But here what I'll, here's what I'll say. I think that there's a general prejudice that people have when they grow up in America, and they bring those prejudices with them into the workplace that they have in their lives. So when they see a story about a young black man uh, that's doing well, sometimes that story makes the air. Right, because it's kind of considered to be an anomaly. That's the weird part of the prejudice. Mm -hmm. Is like, oh, look what we found. <laughs> this interesting black guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Don't choke, <laughs> <Jack. laughs> <Don't show laughs> But it happens. Uh, and there's another group of African American men that we haven't talked about. You talked about rappers. You talked about entertainers. But we also have politicians. Right. We have a black president who's on television every single day. Um, and that man is, is changing people's perceptions, I think, when he's mm -hmm. out there every single day. You've got African-American senators now who come through, both Democrat and Republican. Um, you, you have African-American governors that are out there. So, you know, it is a more complex picture, but I do think people bring their prejudices to the media, and when they d report on a story that involves black men doing something negative, those prejudices do come out. How important is um, for parents uh, they have choice in their education when it comes to uh, giving black children the best option for getting the best education, especially given how you talk about how difficult it is in the workplace. And a lot of parents feel as though some school systems just don't work, and so? they should have options. <laughs> <What? So? laughs> well, well, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. So, yeah. Well, we already know, everybody, there's, there's no secret. There is a problem with our education system, especially when, it, uh, in, when we're talking about African-American children. Um, there's a guy by the name of Dr. Jawanda Kanjufu uh, who has some excellent books, um, The Countering Conspiracy to Destroy Little Black Boys, and he has a series of books that have basically outlined what the problems are. And our young people are basically sitting in these schools not learning about themselves. They're totally um, uh, disenfranchised from the, the style of learning. Uh, there's probably like one guy, that Mr. Canada, up in Harlem that's really doing it right. But for the most part, the education system, this is not a disrespect thing, this is a fact thing. Uh, they just basically teach our kids to remember a whole bunch of dates and times, but they don't teach them how to think and live. So how, how do we do a better job? Let's just start with the education. Well, I, and I, I hear the question, and I, I think that education needs to take on a broader mosaic. Okay. That, you know, I'm not here to advocate for charter schools, I'm not here to advocate for private or single gender or single uh, culture. But should you have a buffet? You, it should be a, a, a broad spectrum okay. of opportunities. You can go from Tim King up in Chicago as uh, single gender, black male. Uh, David Banks, wonderful American um, Eagle Academy Foundation, Jeffrey Canada. Uh, these, these are, uh, even here in Washington, D.C., uh, uh, Marco Clark, Richard Wright, Public Charter School. They, they're different types of options which expands the choice for parents. So it's not to say that we want to turn our backs on the public school system completely, but there are just areas, you know, and when, especially when you look at the per pupil expenditure in places like Washington, D.C., in New York, and in L.A., I mean, it's just through the roof so that that money is not touching these kids. The money's not going where it's supposed to go. So I think the options need to be opened up, uh, especially education-wise in, uh, in some of these tougher areas because, we, you know, we're dealing with it, it and you know, I'm not going to deal with graduation because I, I think that's a myth. I'm not dealing with dropout. I think that's a myth. I know it's a myth. What I'm dealing with are things like um, uh, uh, STEM, 
competency and literacy uh, and uh, math and science. So if we want to talk about those, we can talk about disparate gaps, but I'm not going to talk about underachievement because that's affecting us as a nation and not just black you know, people. One of, one of the things that's happening in this conversation is that I think we're making, um, we're addressing this conversation in the same way a lot of people often do, which is that we're talking about the black community, the black male. Right. And the reality right. is there are black communities, mm -hmm. right? And there right. are black, different groups of black males who are doing different things. So we've got to sort of disaggregate this. We've got to pull it apart a we'll little pull bit. Pull it apart. Let us see <laughs> And look at <laughs> where and different people are doing different things. Take us there. So, for instance, I have, a, uh, I have a brother who lives here in Washington who's a principal at Kramer Middle School in Anacostia. And he will tell you that he's probably got, he's got a huge number of kids in his school who are one of four or five children living in a household with a single mother who is under the age of 30 years what, old. Don't let me interrupt you. I've got to respect my cues when I have to go out to break because we're going to take some call questions from the audience when we come back. We're going to take a short break, but when we come back, we'll hear much more of this provocative discussion from this provocative panel. And don't forget to make your voice heard and tweet your questions at hashtag industry convo and stay tuned during the break to watch more about the benefits of joining DCTV. <laughs> It is so nice to meet you. As you know, we have been super busy with our year-long 25th anniversary celebrations. But let me tell you, everyone here at DCTV has been super excited for your visit. Oh, may I take your coat? Well, if I had a coat that nice, I wouldn't want to take it off either. <laughs> Follow me, please. Oh, I see you noticed one of our training classes. DCTV has been remarkable in training adults, youth, and organizations in TV production over these 25 years. It is really important for us to not only be a platform for producers, but also a building block for future generations. And to think we have these classes for free, or for very little cost. Well, we have a very special guest who has been waiting for you in the studio. Follow me, please. As you can see, DCTV has turned the Brooks Mansion into a state-of-the-art HD facility. DCTV also airs over 900 hours of locally produced programs each month. And last year, we trained elementary, high school, and college youth and adults, which resulted in over 1,000 hours of training. We're here. DCTV is illuminating the city with its 25th anniversary celebrations. That's right, we said celebrations because we're celebrating the entire year with amazing events for everybody. That means we're celebrating the entire year? Check out the events. Concerts featuring major recording artists, celebrity hosted game nights, flash mob events, mouth watering food festivals, and so much more. And each event is free. Free is my favorite word. For more information about that year full of events, log on to DCTV.org or just watch the channel. Look forward to seeing you there. Turn up. <laughs> Mom, can we get some ice cream? Please, Mom, please. No, we're having dinner yeah. soon. Please. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of children in foster care who will take you just as you are. Jamal Simmons, Jake Morton, and easy. Listen, you were talking about there's a plethora of communities that involves black people. Please continue to come. So the different that. communities. So I was referring to my brother's school over in Anacostia who has a lot of kids who are in that school who are, you know, one child in a household with four or five <laughs> others, one single mom, right? That one kid in that household uh, needs something very different than a kid who, who's growing up in the northwest part of D.C., got both of his parents or her parents um, in, in the household, or uh, one parent who's making a middle-class income. I mean, it's a very different kind of environment. So we've got to think about what different young boys and men need to get through to where they need to go. Um, I, you know, I do some work. I have a website called flyclick.com, and flyclick is focused on lowering the barriers on technology 
for young people so that they see themselves in what's happening in the, in the technology sphere. I don't want to see another generation where we have 3% of computer science exam takers, AP exam takers, be African American in this country. That number is too small. You can't have that number and then see us be participate in this growing industry, $2 trillion global industry, um, and no African Americans are participating. Less than 2% of people who start uh, tech companies are African American or Latino. Those numbers cannot continue. Let me, let me raise, let me bring something very sensitive into the dialogue. Uh, I want to talk about the issue of race and the impact it has on the opportunities and the achievement. And what does it really mean when you say black men, black people? What are the images and what is the mindset when you hear that? And how it is internalized and what people become and how they're supposed to act. Well, help, help us understand. I, I did a, an interesting kind of case study in one of the films that I did in Hoodwink. And I went around Howard University, Bowie State University, um, Virginia Union University, a couple of HBCUs, and I asked a singular question. I'm, I'm getting to your point. I asked young black people to name a positive stereotype, because stereotypes can be positive or negative. Mm -hmm. so name a positive stereotype about black people. Dead silence. Dead silence cannot formulate a constructive, positive uplift of a group definition anywhere, anytime. Can because I ask the most creative people on the face of the planet? Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm not asking you. <laughs> 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 I'm talking about the generation we failed. Yeah. That we've given them so much of this garbage, the garbage of, of dropout, the garbage of incarceration, the garbage of inadequacy, the garbage of uh, that you're all less the wedlock births. Yeah, all, even that, that yeah. the, you know, the single mama drama. Yeah. All, all, we've told them they can recite negative stereotypes. They can write a dissertation on that thing. How deep is that impact? It, it is in, it, an inculcated message into the heart, mind, and soul of a generation. That at, like this is one of the hardest episodes that I had to edit in a film. I had to sit there and watch, you know, over and over again, young black people who cannot come up with one summary statement of collective worth of who they are or we as a people are. That's a painful space for us to be in right now. And again, I think it's a reflection of even some of the things like, not this panel, but panels I've been on in the past, forum discussions, state of black America, how messed up is the brother, save our sons, help our brothers out, all of this garbage that has always told them that they are no good. And we've got to change this thing. We have got to turn the, the perception and do a paradigm shift, understand where this, this data and this perception come from why it's skewed this way, why the media will portray us this way, and then what are the outcomes if we continue along so this path? So let me take it deeper with you, Jamal. Let me come back to entertainment and media. How dangerous, we know the benefits, is it that the media pushes rap artists, entertainers, and celebrities as the role models Jeez. for these generations? You know what's interesting? I'd love to get easy shooting on this, because this is his world where he lives yeah, right. in. But what's interesting to me as I pay attention to this is that the, the young people who are involved in these industries they aren't the same young people who were in it when I was a teenager back in the 1980s, right? So in the beginning, maybe you just wanted, you know, you just wanted a, an artist deal. And then maybe you wanted a label deal. Now people are looking for product deals, right? So these kids are learning that you can't just be an artist. You also have to do something else to be able to make money in this game. And you know what? I don't care if they're rappers. I just want to see them take the money and the shine they get from that experience and then use that to go do something else while they're at it. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that I want to say is, Probably some of the sharpest minds you'll find in the black community are involved in hip-hop and making music. I mean, look at, let's say, uh, Diddy. Now, just recently, they didn't want this guy speaking over at Howard University because he didn't graduate from that school. But look how much money right. this guy has been able, as an entrepreneur. Right. And we know that, you know, in some sense, a lot of people say money is power, correct? Some people would say freedom of speech, yes, mm -hmm. but at what cost to, right. and to whom? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. His message. His message. Yes. I think it, he has a great message. If you want to look at the negative stuff, then and throw that out there. Oh, and, I didn't say and, anything and, negative. Are no, I'm just saying, I'm saying <laughs> there's right. going to be some people that are going to have negative things. Do you to believe say. there's negative stuff? Oh, of course. There's right. good and bad in all so things. So what's the impact hmm. of the negative message? Well, what's the impact of the negative message from Warner Brothers? <laughs> or from ABC? Some people would say they're one and the same. You know what? If you really want to look at it, we really want to look there, at it. There's yeah. a <laughs> okay. So you have a rapper that makes 20 million. Mm 
Let's forget about the money. No, 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 no. Let me finish. Let me finish. No, no, let me watch where I'm going. Watch where I'm going. Take us there. So you have a rapper, and he makes twenty million. What about the guy that gave him the money to make the album, to produce the videos, to get on? How much did he make? Seven hundred million dollars. Seven hundred million dollars. So he's really getting scrapped on the table, and this is happen happening over and over and over again. Let me give you this analogy. Okay, so if the police officer is downtown D.C. looking for a drug dealer, and they see a guy selling drugs on the corner of whatever in Northwest. They're going to go in and say, okay, we see that you're selling drugs. The next question I'm going to ask you is this. Give me who, uh, who uh, your, your, the next guy is. Who is the supplier? Do we ask that about the rapper? No, we, we get mad at the rapper. We don't say, who put you on? We say, you're the problem. We don't look at the guy making $700 million. Okay. Okay, so let me, as the moderator, cut to the chase on this. Okay. You know, as an entrepreneur, I believe in free enterprise. Yep. But are we producing products that have social redeeming value, that help parents be models for their children, reinforce the values that are home, reinforce education, reinforce respect in women, reinforcing what it means to be a man. I'm just asking. No, Does it have an impact? I think, you, I think you're asking the wrong people to deliver the wrong message. Singing, dancing, running, and jumping. Them folks, throw them off the tape. Because if you look at, at the spectrum of millionaires, black people who made over a million dollars, insignificant portion. The singing, dancing, running, and jumping. But they hijacked the conversation because we just have this iconoclast uh, uh, perception of uh, we take authority as truth instead of truth as authority in this country. If you're popular, then you have something relevant to say, and it might be valid, especially when we get into the political sphere, which drives us all crazy. But in this, this larger conversation, we miss the boat again. You know, as we spend our time wasting our heart and soul talking about incarceration, well, we should be talking about this kind of case study. Like, how do you get from Morehouse to Harvard? We need to talk about that. But we want to focus on this. So if we're talking about singing, dancing, running, and jumping. Well, I don't care about it. I really don't like none of them. They got nothing to do, no redeeming social, but they're vibe. Mm. Really, I have not met a rapper yet. There might be one, I don't know, that has any redeemable qualities socially to talk to my kids, period. Have you met Common? Really, Common? <laughs> yeah. Have you met Common? Have you met Most Death? I qualified. <laughs> have you qualified. met KRS-One? I qualified. Have you met Chuck D? I qualified. I said, have I met? Okay. I've met a you few. Know what? Let I've me met a little, little Easy, Little Breezy, <laughs> and Little Cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, but, but my, my point is, though, so what, what I'm saying to you is that do you want these people leading the conversation to our young people no. about what it yeah. is? No, no, I don't want them. I don't, no. I don't want them. I, I, don't even, even, I love Common, and I do love Kanye. But, no, I don't love Kanye. I'm sorry, KRS. <laughs> <laughs> I got caught up. Um, but when it comes to this, what about the Armstrong Williams? What about the Ed Alvin? These guys, quiet, off the radar. Don't know nothing about them. But what about and trajectories? How did you do what you did, and how can we begin to set up pathways for the 1.5 million black boys in college right now that are going to be looking for trajectories and pathways. Let me, let me, outside. Let me spin to Jamal off this point, please. Okay. People talk about young people, but as a child growing up, I had to learn work ethic, discipline, sacrifice, thrift, and being a man for my father. It had to be an example. I would venture to say, and I think the audience would agree, that most young people don't know what work ethic is. Really? No, most don't know what work ethic is. Have you ever been, been in a basketball no, court at 1130 at night? I'm going to reject that too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting it. <laughs> okay. so, you, so you reject the argument? I, do, yeah. I reject the preface. I, I, the preface. I think you're starting from a perspective. First okay. of all, we're not going to create a generation of mini-me's, right? We've okay. got to stop looking at kids and saying, okay. oh, what's wrong with you is you don't think like I do, behave right. like I want you to behave, That's and right. do what I want you to do. See that? Right. I, I didn't do everything that my parents wanted me to do either. Right. And in fact, when I talk to young people, I tell them, your parents are smart, but they ain't that smart. So listen to them, but don't listen to them all the time. Right. Because you're going to have to challenge them, because you see things differently from, from, from what they see. Very good. Because so you have saying, a different perspective. So you're saying that then, this new generation, their parents may not understand who and what they no, are, what I'm, what and I'm they're trying to live by their old ways. No, what I'm saying is Tradition. this. What I'm saying is this. Instead of us starting completely by what's wrong with them, right. let's start with some of the things that are right with them. That's right. Mm -hmm. And what we do know is, if they believe that there is an objective that is attainable, they will work hard for it. They will take risks for it. Mm -hmm. They will stay up they late do. for it and be disciplined for it. If they think they can get a, they can go to the NBA, they'll do that. If they think they can rap, they'll do that. What if they think they can make sports? money selling drugs, they'll take some of the biggest risks there are in life. Yeah. If that's is what that a good thing? Well, what we know is they will do it. But so is that a good thing? So what we have to do is to, t is to hijack their interest 
and then point them in a way that it can be more productive. How do you hijack? Them? So, for instance, so they want to be they want to be a, a basketball player. What a lot of them don't realize is there's a lawyer that basketball player has, there's an agent that basketball player has, there's a team doctor on that basketball team. You can be in the league and not be on the floor and make probably as much money than most other people who are journeyman players in the league. Okay, I'm going to take what you said because I want to take this to another issue. So then why is it that so many of these athletes lose so much of their wealth after they work so hard and all this discipline and all you sacrifice oh. and yet <laughs> can somebody I somebody <laughs> why? why? Tell us why. Um, mm -hmm. very <laughs> sad. Another very sad Pathetic, point. Pathetic, so would say. Yeah, 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 yeah. But look at Magic Johnson. But tell us why. I think they, again, lack role models, uh, individuals in their families. They, have, they don't have the intellectual, uh, the financial intellect to teach them how to save money and how to build wealth, how to hold on to it, and how to cultivate it. But they've they never just been taught. They do and have and you know what? You know what? The school system does not teach in, uh, financial intelligence at all either. They don't do it. So how do you expect these guys to get millions of dollars and then expect them to be able to manage it? The schools are no, teaching no, 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 any of these guys. No, no, no. We're separating these. These are two different conversations. So you can't, you can't okay. mix this up. Okay. Like, yeah, okay. They're Fair smart enough. on the court. Oh, okay. Yes, we agree. Like with that. me, I'm good at school, but they didn't teach me how to do taxes. Mm -hmm. right. Really, you know, IRS called me the first time I went. <laughs> I, 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 I know how to handle that. I mean, I gotta get a lawyer. But what I'm saying is, you can have intellect in a space. And your point is so valid because I, I, these brothers, young brothers right here, are just affirming what you're saying. Like we can no longer stop. Like you know, sitting back, going, you know what? You don't know your history. You don't know where you came from. You know, you don't know how to pull your pants. All that. Hold, foolish. hold, hold that. Hold that. It's too. We don't want to disrupt. It's so good. <laughs> we're going to a break. It's a short break. Later in the show, we will take some questions from the live studio audience. And again, don't forget to keep the conversation going by using hashtag industry convo. And stay tuned during the break to watch more about the benefits of joining DCTV. And guess what? We'll be back. <laughs> we're here. I'd like you to meet Mr. Holman. Hello, I'm Kwame Holman from PBS's NewsHour, and I'm also a very proud member of DCTV's Board of Directors. Thanks for coming to our headquarters today. I'll take it from here, Stacy. Thank you. You know, this is one of our state-of-the-art studios. These studios allow DCTV members to create dynamic programming of an entertainment nature, of a news nature, and of an educational nature. Come on around and have a seat. Our DCTV producers create programs for an audience of 375,000 people in the District of Columbia. DCTV has a long and storied history that stretches all the way back to 1988. You are right, Kwame. DCTV is a nationally recognized community media network that first went on the air in 1988. DCTV expanded its channels and its studios, moving from operating out of a cubicle in DuPont Circle to another small facility in the Anthony Boeing YMCA to Brooks Mansion in 2000. <clears throat> I'm, I'm sorry. She's just very excited. You know, we all are. You know, our training efforts here at DCTV and the technology upgrades that we've done have allowed our members to create the kind of programming that has a national impact. Here, take a look. DCTV has proudly served as a catalyst for many of its members who are making an impact in the national spotlight. Here are just a few of our talented members. DC, Maryland, and Virginia, and where I was born, LA, I love you. Thank you for getting me this far. The connection to the night of power feel and what do you feel like you have to do in response to that connection well let me say first um, mr. Blackwell that uh, I would say assalamu alaikum and Ramadan Mubarak to all the millions and as you mentioned 1.6 billion Muslims throughout the world at Lindsay Automotive we're always trying to improve the car buying experience to make it more personal we thought about hiring grandmas grandma I know you can do better than that <laughs> oh no. That grandmama's pie. 
Then we thought again. DCTV has aided these three members and several others as they are making an impact in the national spotlight. Now back to you, Kwame. Pretty impressive, right? Let me show you something else. To see when this and other shows are airing on DCTV, log on to dctv.org and click View Full Schedule. You can also watch DCTV live on the internet 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, no matter where you are. DCTV, anytime, anywhere. You know, you can give just anybody a lot of money. A lot of people make money for seasons and just no different than the lottery winners. But if you don't have no financial background and no understanding what you have and know what money is and the value of it, somebody's going to take it from you. It's going to become their wealth building. And so a lot of these athletes and entertainers are wealth building for somebody else because they know as soon as they sign that contract, they can exploit them. But, not to belabor that point, uh, I was... Uh, but we now were, you're starting to get those role models, though. You are starting to get the Magic Johnson that you referenced before. Right, and Magic can have a conversation with uh, LeBron James or with the next generation and have that conversation with them in a way that you or I can't, right? And so these, mo these role models matter. And we talked earlier about finishing school. You know, there's a guy named Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel is paying kids to drop out of college, come work for him, and paying them $50,000 a year to start companies, That's right. right? You know how many African Americans in the last two classes that he's had? Two. Because they're unaware. Because they're unaware. Okay. And we, we got to get to our young how people do, how and do they get find them out about more this engaged in these, in these programs. And some of us as adults, education is important. But most people who have become very wealthy in the technology space have done that when they were teenagers is when they started. So they need to be in school and they need to be building companies at the same time. It's a new game. The compliment to that, too, especially as we're talking about black men, uh, Dr. Ivy Tolson out at Howard University did a great analysis of the top ten incomes uh, ten positions that black men are, the, are uh, the top dollar, and six of those ten are non-educational related. So construction uh, business owner and a refuse service, or some of the, these, there are other trajectories. Ed, there's an importance to education, but there's, as uh, Booker T. Washington, if you teach a man how to think and not how to work with his hands, you taught half a man. So this other stuff, that's, that trajectory, especially the tech, I love that stuff. There's other trajectories out there outside of traditional post-secondary achievement, even though young black men are doing phenomenal in that space. Let me, let me take a, talk about a taboo subject, briefly. Cause uh oh, uh -oh. here there's, we go. Something take this mic off, man. <laughs> <laughs> something that people don't want to talk about anymore. Is there, is there a place for moral striving and in faith and God in this debate when we talk about black men and families? Is there still a role for God in uh, it's the age of man when man has become God and God is no longer needed. I, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, what I said by geez. somebody about mentioning that, but is there a need for it? I think absolutely. I think success is built on a three-legged stool is what I was always taught, right? It's skills, it's opportunity, and it's will. Government can help you get skills. Government can help you get opportunity. Government can't give you the will to succeed. The will to succeed has to come from families. It has to come from church, faith communities. It has to come from value-based systems. And that's the place for communities to really focus on young people is to get them to start to focus on what it is they have to do in order to be successful and point them to some of these new opportunities that many of them never heard, never heard of. I had never heard of setting, being an advanced person for a president of the United States and, set, and traveling around the world doing that. I didn't even know that job existed until I was 22 years old, right, 21 years old. So we've got to explain what these new opportunities are to them so that they know what it is they're shooting for. I think easy and uh, both of us are probably in the same space with this. I'm a Christ-centered advocate for the reconciliation of the black family. That's my core. That's what I define. I, I just cannot imagine a world, especially as a, as a black man in this experiment, in this country, that this is not the thing that holds the fabric of myself, my family, my community, our work. Uh, and all of us together. I just, I can't, I can't fathom. I meet black atheists all the time. It's, it's, it's yeah. an amazing <laughs> thing to me. I, I just can't wrap my mind around it. But for, for what I know, I know, I know the divine. And there's no reason I even get to sit on a stage like this without that. It, it just doesn't happen. So. You know, I was having a conversation with one, um, one of my daughters. And my oldest daughter, we were having a conversation about um, music, hip-hop, and artists nowadays are talking about God. And they're mentioning God more than we've ever heard in any rap song. So I think that this generation, they're, they're getting it in a different way. They may not be going to church, right. but when Rick Ross says, hallelujah, <laughs> they know it means all praise, you know, go to God, you know. Right. Um, and I think that that's a good thing. 
And for some people that are not into hip hop, they were, what about all the negative stuff? He used all this other language, but he said, hallelujah, he offset that. But no, because there's going to be some young brothers out there that don't have no concept or even mindset that there is God. But when someone like, you know, a rapper says hallelujah, or when RG3 scores a touchdown and puts his fingers in the air like that and gives it up, you know, I think that the young people will realize that there is a God, you know, and they can, that can open up the door for their further growth uh, spiritually. Let, let us delve into something that is having a, a devastating impact on many communities. You know, um, would it be progress if we could just decriminalize drugs? Um, because it, it, some people will argue that it's just outrageous that a, young, a lot of young men are in jail over drugs, and you have people who are involved in domestic violence, they kill, they have a lesser sentence than somebody on drugs. I mean, imagine the number of these young men would not be in jail if we were just all together to criminalize it and take that economic They already order. did that in D.C. and in Maryland, at least with marijuana. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to say this, and I'll let you guys comment. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the interesting part about it is we have a, 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 a huge amount of brothers that are in jail for those crimes of selling drugs or weed or whatever. And now... The government, the states that actually put you in jail, want to be able to sell the weed and make money off of it, just like the brothers did that are locked up. Right. Because they have a record, they can't qualify right. in order exactly. to be able to vote. work in a legitimate. Yeah, they can't right. even vote to get those guys out. <laughs> well, well, to exactly. Do, to, there's a great, a phenomenal this thing that I, I became an advocate for the decriminalization, and this is what gets me in trouble with the church, even though I preach in churches, for everything. I was, uh, Portugal uh, decriminalized personal use of everything everything and one of the things that came out of this was the HIV rates fell through the floor and I'm trying to connect it I was like what in the world Cause, you know I'm, I'm a numbers guy I'm going through it, I'm going mm -hmm. through it. and it, they came out of the closets they came out from behind out of the shadows and got clean needles HIV fell through the floor that was a, my tipping point That was about seven or eight years ago so when you look at 42 percent uh, at the federal level of all uh, criminals I'm sorry incarcerates being associated with nonviolent drug use so in some way shape or form it touches almost half, you take that off the table and as a libertarian, I'm, I'm all for disempowering the government. So kid, I don't want to see another brother in chicken wings over a joint ever again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Chicken well, wings, I'm sorry, chicken well, wings. The, the question is why do people sell drugs? People sell drugs to make money, right? And so if they don't have other ways to make money, they're going to continue to sell drugs. So you decriminalize it, they're not going to jail, but people are still selling drugs in our community. Do we want that? I'm not sure that we do. So the question for me becomes, what other opportunities are there for these young men to make money so that they can do all the things that most other young men and women in the world want to do? You're talking about an honest living. Absolutely. Well, yeah. if it's I'm decriminalized, right. it's honest. <laughs> Stay tuned. Uh, listen, we should really give BCTV a round of applause for pulling this together. It's just, just a tremendous job. Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Congratulations to them. When we come back, we're going to take questions from the audience and stay tuned during the break to watch more about the benefits of joining DC TV. And guess what? We're coming back even stronger than before. Stay tuned. Pretty cool, huh? Well, I know you're interested in learning about DC TV's 25th anniversary events. We have some exciting ways you and your organization can become involved with DC TV. We have sponsorship opportunities with benefits that will help us and you. Yes, this unique opportunity will promote you to the 375,000 viewers we reach on television and thousands more through our internet, e-newsletters, and our sponsor for our live 25th anniversary events. Best of all, those funds help DCTV continue and continue to grow. We really have done so much over these years, like growing from one channel to seven channels currently airing on Comcast, RCN, and Verizon Fios. Membership has increased, thank you, from 50 members to hundreds annually, and we continue setting new standards, such as the live streaming of all DCTV programs online and on any mobile device. We support you, and we're looking for a little support from you in return. We have executives standing by, waiting for you to help us continue DCTV. And we're looking forward to your joining us on the next stage of our journey. Act now to take advantage of our many wonderful sponsorship opportunities. Visit DCTV.org and click on the Donate button, or contact a representative by email or phone. With such a wonderful opportunity, why would you pass it up?
If you drive buzzed, it could cost you around $10,000. You'll face major legal fees, major fines, and steep insurance penalties. You could lose everything. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. I grew up in the housing projects of Cleveland. I didn't even know that life could be any better than it was. Education for me has been a way to get away from the agony of what was normal life. I want to be able to impact the community, not just look back on where I came from, but to reach back to where I came from and pull some people up with me. My name is David, and I am your dividend. Here we go. We're going we're gonna to make some juice. Looks good. You ready to try it? Challenge your kids to be active and eat healthy. It's OK. OK. I she took another sip. You saw it? Search We Can for ideas on how to get healthy together. And yes, we're back. And we're loving this audience, right? Yeah, we're loving audience. this audience. Right. We're loving this audience, yes. And we're loving DC TV. Yes, <laughs> we're loving DC TV. <laughs> I'm uh, Well, we are back. At this time, we're going to take questions as promised from the audience and Twitter. Uh, these questions are brilliant. Here's the first question, so this doesn't have a name to it. Um, so state the way you want the black male image to look, sound, in 20 years, including accomplishments. Oh, no, no, brother. We're going to start with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm start. Okay. I'll tell you exactly where I want. I said this before. African Americans are the most creative and innovative people in the yes. face of the planet. Yes. I want us to not run away from that, right? Let's just figure out how we can capitalize on that. We have it naturally, like a natural resource. Let's capitalize on that. Let's marry up that innovate, the innovate, innovation and creativity with some more skills, and we can have the most productive entrepreneurs and business people in this country if we can figure out how to do that. And once that happens, we will wash away a lot of these other problems. We're not going to have everyone ask. That's the same question. We can come back because we want to move there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Keep that one. <laughs> um, do you believe um, the black male image is under attack to validate the white male image? Is that me? You, that's Jay. Me. That's me. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's easy. Yeah. Explain. Um, the castigation of black male identity is one of my areas. Th and this thing goes back to Nimrod. I mean, if I say Nimrod on this stage, people will think, Idiot, I believe. Is that the stereotype? No. <laughs> no? I read my Bible, well, so y'all know. <laughs> I got no. Hang on. I'm teaching young people about Nimrod. But the, 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 the denigration, the casting, this is a long narrative. I don't know what, it's sinister. I don't know what, what and why, but it just goes on. I mean, um, we, we just talking about, you know, you turn on the 6 o'clock news. I just moved to Atlanta. I, I, I didn't like the news up here. I can't stand it down there. I mean, I really don't like how that lead story is always about, well, today over in Southeast, blah, 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 shot somebody, some, some, blah, 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 blah. Mm. You know, it just, if it bleeds, it leads. The media is going to take that, and that has become this, this perception of black identity that, that, because there's so much that they can hit us with right now. They can hit you from the Internet. They can hit you from the news feed. They can hit you from, you know, your smartphone. They can hit you from my Xbox. Yeah, send me a, anyway. My, my point is... <laughs> That we, we've got so many different outlets to take in bad information right now that it's just everyone's fighting for our attention and to put the sorry, no good, criminalized, homogenized black man in front of you is an easy way to catch your attention. So let me, let me raise this uh, because I think the audience would be interested in, in this question. Who stands to gain financially um, from these images? Wow, that's a very good question. Um, businesses? What uh, businesses? All of them. Every How? Single, okay, let's just Simple. say, uh, let's just talk about news media. Let's talk about Fox News Network. <laughs> <laughs> Can we do that? Yes. Okay. Yes, of course. So they oversaturate us with negative stories about African American men and families, correct? Is that, is that, does that happen a lot? Do you see that? Okay, so that's a fact, right? Everyone, we're, we're straight on that. Okay, why do they do it? They want to keep you watching, right? They want to keep you watching because after they give you the news, what are they going to do? They're going to show you what? Commercials, right? Mm -hmm. They want to show you those commercials, right? Because that's where the money is. They want to keep you watching. 
And then there's also the fear factor. So who's watching? Everybody. Everybody. It's, it's everybody. Including black people. It's, it's black. And it's, it's, it's what the tragic part of this is. If you know, if you if you know Nielsen, and you know, okay, here to put it in simple terms, if, if it didn't if it didn't pay to put black bad news about black people on, think about the Super Bowl and how much thirty seconds costs. It pays mm. to capture your attention. That, down. That, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, Can I ask a question? Yes. Do we bear any responsibility Us? for the crimes that we commit? Of, the course. of course we do. Of course we yeah, do. I mean, that, that's. And so, how do we deal with that? I, th I think that what we have to do is understand in the context. Like, I have a dear friend who's wrote this book about the mass incarceration of black men. In context, I disagree that it's been a mass incarceration. If you go back 50 years, the same, it was 36% of black men were incarcerated then, 39% today. It's not been this big boom. It's just been what it's been. And then if you throw in the recidivism rate of 72.9%, it's we talk about the same people. So what I'm saying is, like, get that crap off my table and let's talk about you. Let's talk about you so he can figure out what to do. Is that making sense to you? He's in college right now. But that's a, not news, and, though. Th that, that's, that's not, not news. Yeah, that, that's not. That's that not, doesn't sell. But, but that's saying, not what they want to hear, I'm, though. But I'm answering his question of what do we need? Uh, what do we need to do? We need to we need to offset and counterbalance the story because they got that. But memo. I think Jamal is asking a deeper question that I you're missed refusing it to address. What is it? What role do black people play in their own demise? Oh, jeez. That's a tough question. Is it? Yeah, yeah. It, it, Are you it really, asking? Do we perpetuate stereotypes? Do we feel no? Do we become uh, self-fulfilling? Uh, it, like, is it you got this image that's out there, and do we fall into the the trappings of that image? That's a tough question. Right. I mean, you, you don't I want mean, people are shooting each other. Let me yeah. do this. No, no, I'm, yeah, you're <laughs> right, Let's do right. this. Let me ask the audience by a show of a hand. Yeah, that's a good question. Do do you believe that black people participate in their own destruction and perpetrating these images? But, but we applaud if you agree. <laughs> But, but, see, but, 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 but what, I'm, what I'm careful of is... But why do we I, do it? No, but I don't want to... Are we going to ask the why question? You're going to answer the why. Okay, the why, okay, so if a brother goes out there and uh, breaks in your car or tries to rob you and, and take your purse, why would he do that? Probably because he wants to eat. Well, this right? Is, I'm going to reel it back. And I'm not trying to justify it. I'm just saying that there is a why. We have to ask the why question. We just can't just throw it out there and not ask why these things well, are No, no, no. I, no, no, I, 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 know, when, I know how I want to answer you. When the please, high let number me, please, let me have, let me have this. Sure, let me, I, sure. This is why I want to I had to think about it. This sure. is what it is. You said do black people participate in like their own demise and it's not that it's not all it's a percent of black people that are doing this Chris Rock got into all kind of trouble for doing you know there's black people and then there's the n-words mm -hmm. and, and w what you have is I, I did this analysis of Tyler Perry movies because I can't stand them but what percent of our community <laughs> is supporting this dude to keep him in my in my television set right. and, and it's less than like six percent of us go to the movie Why theater you stand there? I don't believe he portrays a, a positive image of black women. I think he hates black women. Do you women. agree with this? No, they don't. They don't. Uh, no. She loves Medea. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about Medea. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about Medea. I'm talking about the, how he is, the arc that he has portrayed black women in. I really don't think he likes black women. I, I, what he has done to black women in film, how he has portrayed them as the victim and, and just angry and loud and let mad. Me, let me go to this. Um, Are we live? <laughs> no, we are live. Are we live? <laughs> yeah, you are live. <laughs> you are all the way live. We're going to. We're going to. No, my, my, how do we? How do we? How do we change the self-perception of black men from rappers and athletes to market makers and entrepreneurs? Can I have that? Yes, one? easy. Okay. Uh, we, during the break, we were talking about. Um, um, the uh, what, this is the brother's keeper thing that right. the president, the president is doing. Brother, which is a yes, wonderful thing the initiative. Yes. This thing is a monster. I'm so excited about what our president has done. It's monumental. Uh, we've never seen anything like this in the history of this country. And I think that what's going to happen is once the money gets into those programs with the churches, with the organizations, it's going to help young people be able to see positive things and be able to do more positive things. But this so has you think the money will actually make it yes. to the program? Yes. Oh, it has okay. to. It has, it has to. to. And it, it, it has to. And they're saying that this is supposed to be rolled out over the next five years, so he right. won't be the president, but the money will still be there to help these young brothers because we know where there's money, you know, there can be and, more and, power. And here's what I'll add to that, which is there are alternative images of African Americans out there, right? So the media spent, I, I was part of it, you were probably a part of it, the media spent an entire year yeah. telling the story of Barack Obama. And they told it from every single angle. They talked about him as if he was the second coming of Christ. I mean, it was, it was, I mean, they were on Barack Obama because it was a great story. So uh, what I would say is the media, if anything else, is chasing dollars. 
And so look at CNN right now, which is running wall-to-wall -wall airplane coverage, that which is, uh, which is right. horrible for the 200 and however many families that are involved. But is that the only story going on in America that takes up 40 minutes of my hour or hours worth of news? Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is about making money in the, course mm -hmm. of a, in the course of a media day. Mm -hmm. If there's a good black story that they can make money off of, they'll tell that story. If there's a bad black story they can make money off of, they'll tell that story. And so we've got to come up with some more good black stories. Let me, um, let me go back to the Twitter. How can you have a conversation about issues facing black men and not make a single mention of the system of white supremacy? Wow. Wait, you, up already, huh? Wow. Oh, was that a tweet from Dr. Francis Cresswell? <laughs> See, Dr. Dr. Wilson, how you doing? <laughs> Is there such a thing as white supremacy? Oh, yes. Supremacy? Is there such a thing as black supremacy? Yes. I, 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 I think so. I, 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 but I think here's the premise of just we joke, we said, we mentioned Dr. Cress Walsing. And her teaching basically is this in order for you to be able to be a racist, you have to have power. Right, so do black people have power? There are situations where black people have power. Yes, we do, in certain situations. Mm -hmm. But not all of them. Everybody in a certain situation has power. If you so the question so, is, how if, do you exercise that if power? If you offend really somebody at that McDonald's drive-in and they don't like you, they can spit in your food mm -hmm. or put something in it. They have power. Mm -hmm. It depends upon the kind but of but power. But in a larger context yes. of, of white supremacy, and, you know, uh, uh, recently watching, you know, as we go through Ishtar the past week or so, the imagery of, of white Christ is, is really starting to annoy me. And I don't want to turn into like Jeremiah, right? Uh, I, I'm, uh, you know, partially there, but th this system is set up to elevate white identity. It's just, it's just been like that. I mean, it, it's just a given. And the, the counter side of that where, where we get into, you know, trouble is that in order to elevate white, they, they denigrated everything else. It wasn't just black. It was everything. And with that being the, the construct in which we navigate, we need to understand that system. You know, again, so my libertarian always kicks in. I'm like, you know, do you, if you keep fighting this system and keep losing, why do you still go and try to fight a system? So can I give you an alternative? How about building new institutions oh, that's based on I'm, the that's new exactly reality that's of the majority that's exactly, of the country? That's exactly, that's exactly where I'm going. Which includes Who's, some white yeah, people right. who so, actually aren't trying to right, oppress us. Like, yeah, like Tim Watts. <laughs> right. You know, right. Right. So, yeah. but, but again, we, I'm not going to try to, to sh reshape a, a system to f that was never set up to service me. I'm going to create a new system. How do you do things outside of that? I mean, let me raise this question because it's going to lead to uh, a wrap. Um, what measures of reform can we take to harvest financial intellect and literacy. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and his point, I think the point is well taken. You yeah. know, you talk about these images, but you know what? If you don't own media, you really don't have freedom of speech. You can't control your images. Right. You know, one of the things that the Jews did after coming out of the Holocaust, they say never again. Right. They own Hollywood, they own the media, right. they own right. it. And mm -hmm. you don't see these same images of right. Jews that you see right. of blacks in the media. Why? Because they don't own them. Not only do they own it, yeah. but if they, are, if they slight them in any way, right. they're going to come they back. Gonna <laughs> right. You can also own the advertising that pays for the yeah. shows that, that go on. Right. But what but, about the entrepreneurship? But, but like, what about the, the ownership? The ownership of, of media is a No, the ownership of more in your communities. There were times in communities they used to own everything. Listen, the newspaper, everything. Every, the newspaper. But, and I think that goes, if you tie that back to the breakdown of the family, which I know you guys love that part, but w when you lose the backbone of the family, if you look at the, the other ethnicities right now that are really doing good in entrepreneurship, the family is intact. I know that there, there's a correlation between the two, maybe not a causation, but when you take the family apart, you lose entrepreneurship. It just happens all over the place. So until we begin to restore the heart, mind, and soul of the family and who we are, and really, this is just going back to who we were before. Well, why can't we just turn the dollars over to the community five times like others do? You, you, it's, just, it's just not there. The, the church. The, the, the trust the, first. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> if you don't, trust the, you don't trust your friend. You don't even know who your neighbor is. That's where we are right now, five doors down. And this is going back to where we were. We knew who we were as a community. Listen, we, listen, we also live in a different interdependent world. I don't care where your business is. Your business can be in a white part of town. What do you do with your money after you make it matters a lot more to me than where your business is and who the customers are that you're selling to. You know what? Believe it or not, we're out of time. Wow. I cannot <laughs> thank you enough for this important discussion. And we have to congratulate DCTV, but we really want to thank the audience for your wonderful yeah, questions. We, we, tonight, we started this discussion. We've given you new things to think about to empower you where you are. 
Because listen, the government and nobody's going to come where you are to make a difference with your children and your community. It starts with you with a little faith, a little backbone, and one person with courage and conviction makes that majority. Start being the majority instead of the minority. I'm Armstrong Williams. On behalf of the panel, good night on behalf of DCTV.